up, boy. One, testing. Okay, test, thank you. Test. Die flowing warm 
supply reading ming la has been my thing and shall be till i die and shall be till i die and shall be till i die reading ming la has been my thing and shall be till i die i believe thou has prepared how worthy thou i be for me a plot of free reward a golden harmony tis strong and too for endless year and full by power divine to sang in God in Father's year no Wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away. To sung in Father's bitter year, no harder than Father. In the morning when I rise, get me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can't have all this world. world you can have all this world but give me Jesus To trust in Jesus, just to take Him at His word, just to rest upon His promise, just to know that says the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I put Him up in all. Jesus, Jesus, 
precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him Welcome, everyone. Um, why don't we stand um, for our first song? We're going to see "My Jesus, I Love Thee," and I know we're all here um, in celebrating uh, Jody's ordination. Um, just her life here so far, and um, the youth that she's affected, and more than that. And I, I think. The reason why we picked this song and this whole set is to, again, with Easter coming up, I think it's only fitting that everything that we do, um, our heart, our eyes are fixed upon Jesus. And without him, this would be meaningless. So uh, as we come together, as we sing these sets, um, may we remember that. time my Jesus my Jesus I Just our voices. My Jesus, I love thee. I know our mind. For thee, all the follies of sin I resign. My Savior, my Savior, 
resting with us, there is strength. There is strength within sorrow. There is beauty in our tears. And you meet us in our mourning. Out here. You are working in our waiting. Sanctify us. When beyond our understanding, you're teaching us to trust. Sing this together, your plans. Your plans are still to prosper. You have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood. You're faithful forever, perfect in love. You are sovereign over us.
perfect in love, you are sovereign over us. Father, Lord, I just want to thank you for who you are and the sovereign plan, Lord. In all things, we thank you for ultimately send your son die on the cross for us so we can, we can call ourselves your children, Lord. And I pray that as we celebrate this time together, we continue um, to come back to this again, this truth that, that Lord, there's we're nothing without you. And all that um, sin that you carried for us on the cross and died um, and suffered in our, for our sake, Lord. I, I pray um, as we celebrate, um, not just today, but um, our new life in you and um, just celebrating Easter, Lord. Would you continue to teach us and reveal to us this love, um, the truth in that, Lord.
sing thy I'll sing thy power to say Amen um, Let's bow our heart um, and I'll welcome Elder uh, Peter Zhang to pray for us, thank you Dear Heavenly Father Dear Lord Jesus, dear Holy Spirit, we thank you, we thank you, thank you for your goodness, thank you for what you have done in life, your power to save, that's what we want to sing every moment of our life. Lord, we thank you. We often mar marvel at your creation work, the stars and the moon that you have ordained the work of your fingers. But Lord, King David says, what is man you are mind of? And what's the son of man that you visit them? And dear Lord, every one of us standing in this auditorium, we are the masterpiece of your work. And Lord, when you create the universe, you, you create it with speaking a word. But when you saved us, you paid a huge price. You are our Redeemer. We thank you. And dear Lord, today we are here to celebrate your work on each individual of us, particularly on Minister Jody. And the scripture says, I knew you when I formed you in the womb and set you apart. And Lord, we thank you. Yes, you foreknew her. You predestined her, you called her, and you justified her, and one day you will glorify her. And thank you, Lord, and we all celebrate at your works in her life, in our own individual life. And Lord, you are a good God. And Lord, today, as we are, we are celebrating this huge, huge event, we ask your presence to be there, your manifest presence to be there. Lord, bless us bless us as we as we witness the wonderful you work you have done in her life and dear lord we want to join moses and pray and teach us thy way so that we might find favor in your sight and bless us thank you we count this as a very important moment in each one of our life it is special Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Wow. What a moment. You know, I want to uh, briefly uh, um, tell you about how we have arrived to this point. Minister Jody has been with us for more than 10 years, serving faithfully and fruitfully. And yet she has impacted many, many lives in W. And I can see a lot of youth here. So in... In the fall of 2016, uh, Senior Pastor David Xu and Personnel Committee recommended her for ordination. And after that, uh, the council, the ordination council was formed with uh, Pastor David Xu, Senior Pastor, and Pastor Dick Lee, Pastor Edward Lee, and Pastor Estella Ling, Pastor Ben Lam, and Dr. Grace May. And they met in, on November the 10th, 2016, to examine her salvation experience, her call to ministry, her theological beliefs, her philosophy ministry, and her personal integrity. And they concluded with, with unanimously recommending her for ordination to the church council. So with the support of the church council, in our December 2016 membership meeting, we approved for Jody's ordination. So with great joy on behalf of the membership and the leadership, I commend Minister Jody for ordination. Um, well, a round of applause, I guess. Well, I would like to have uh, Seneda Lowe from uh, Fort Bend Church to, on behalf of the youth minister. Hello, <laughs> um, Jody. As you know, it's been a little bit of a tradition within our group of Houston area 
pastors and ministers and youth staff to mark special occasions by making collages of pictures of ourselves and then giving them to each other. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it's because someone is moving on to a different ministry field. Um, sometimes it's because someone's moving to a different stage of life. But today, we get to we get the privilege of being a part of your ordination process. So. This will be yours very soon. Um, but I asked the people in these pictures to describe what it is that they admire about your faith and your ministry. And there are certain things that came up over and over again from different people and from different examples. Um, so here are some of the things that we want to share with you today. We admire your longevity. This is truly a testament to your heart for ministry um, and especially youth ministry, which is difficult and physically tiring and often thankless. You have been a cornerstone in the Houston youth ministry for many years. We admire your gift of shepherding, especially in encouraging young females in the church to serve and to lead. Um, whenever there is a shortage of female counselors at camp, and there's always a shortage of female counselors at camp, you have willingly stepped up to, to model leadership um, and WHCC has been so blessed to have seen so many disciples come from your time here. We admire your conviction, your willingness to boldly defend what you believe, but also your willingness to engage in gracious conversation about those things. Um, and we admire your joy, the joy that you have in sharing what you are passionate about, whether that is Hello Kitty, or the process of adoption, right? <laughs> um, but also your love of Jesus Christ and how you invite others into that. We recognize that the joy that you still have after so many years in ministry comes only from a servant who is doing God's work for his glory alone. You have faced many challenges in your time in ministry and you have faced them with boldness and you have faced them with courage. You've overcome all of them to be where you are today. And we are so excited to see the formal recognition by the church of what we already know, your gifts in and your calling to ministry. We're very proud to have been by your side all these years, to have prayed with you, to have planned camps and retreats with you, to have eaten meals with you and served alongside you in ways big and small. And we are excited to continue to do so for years to come. So on behalf of all of the youth pastors, directors, staff in Houston, um, we want to leave you with this verse of encouragement, Jody. It comes from 1 Corinthians 15, and it says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Congratulations, Pastor Jody. TC, I'd like to welcome all of you again to Jody's uh, ordination service into pastoral ministry. Um, this is a very special occasion for us as a church. Uh, Jody, for those of you who know this community, she has been a big, she, Mike and their family has played a big part of what God has done in this church. We believe ordination to be part of a commendation process where the local church commending a proven worker to the greater body of Christ. We also believe that the ordination represents a consecration, an act of recommitting, committing oneself to the ministry call. We also believe that it is a form of confirmation where the body rises up and confirm the ministry call, the fruitfulness, the gifting of the minister. And we believe that it is an act of commissioning sending forth this worker to be an approved workman in the kingdom of God. So right now, I wanna invite Jody to come up as to share her testimony of call with us. Jody. Hello, thank you so much for coming and celebrating this occasion with me. This is my only 
these two options, right? On and off. <laughs> okay, here we go. All right. Since childhood, I have had a special love for ministry. I can honestly say I was one of those weird kids who actually grew up wanting to marry a pastor and wanting to give birth to all these pastor kids and spend all of my days at church. That's the truth. I grew up at another W church, interestingly, in the suburbs of Chicago, Wheaton Chinese Alliance Church. And I have fond memories of sitting on a Chinese Santa's lap at Christmas Eve services, getting gifts, teaching VBS during the summers, babysitting on Wednesday nights for the adult fellowship groups, and attending youth group on the weekends. But by far the best part of going to church each Sunday was getting to go to Arby's afterwards and indulge myself in curly fries. They don't really have as many Arby's here as in the, in the um, Midwest. But those were, those were great times just spending days on Sundays with friends and with family. Through my mom bringing me to church each week and the warmth of having a small community of adults who loved me and lived out their faith all around me, I've never known a time where I was not a Christian believer. And I was baptized on June 2nd, 1991, at the age of three. Just kidding. I went on to become a pre-med major at the University of Kansas and immediately fell in love with the InterVarsity group there, which is a parachurch ministry focused on exposing the campus to the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. I learned how to do inductive Bible study, how to lead a small group, and how to share my testimony with strangers. My faith grew tremendously in college, but it also took the biggest hit of my life in college. For the first time, I began seriously doubting everything I had known to be true. I couldn't understand how a good God could create evil in the form of a serpent. I couldn't understand and convince my Pakistani lab partner that Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life. I didn't know how to handle losing my best friend to a religious cult. I didn't know how to discern my future career. It was all so frustrating and overwhelming that I rebelled against God, I rebelled against the spiritual authorities at InterVarsity, and I just wanted to walk away from it all for that whole year. In the end, what drew me back to the Lord were these constants that I had had in my life before that time of doubting. In middle school, I started having daily devotions, reading my Bible consistently, and that remained through college. I know the word says, blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. I had simple faith. In the midst of doubts and my questioning, my heart kept returning to God's goodness. God is good, and he had proved it over and over by becoming a man, by suffering and dying on the cross, by restoring a new and right relationship with us, which he reminds us of every time we take communion, that Jesus shed his blood on the cross for us. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord has good. I had tasted and I had seen that the Lord is indeed good. I had experienced joy. That must have counted for something. And finally, the third thing was community. I was deeply rooted in a Christian community for a long time which is why I always encourage our youth parents to keep bringing their kids to church. Because just being in that Christian community, I was around authentic believers whom we shared life together. I was never alone. People were always praying for me. The body of Christ had been my second family. And I was also inspired by stories of men and women who had sacrificed everything. Their love for the Lord was so attractive and genuine they were the kind of people I ultimately wanted to become in life, more than some of the rebels that I knew. After graduating from college, I made a commitment to, um, at some point in my life, go into vocational ministry. I had switched out of um, my medical school path and decided that I wanted to become a pastor someday. So I told my dad, and I wasn't quite sure what, where his faith was at the time, but he said that was okay, 
The only requirement was that I get a job and I get real world, real world working experience, as if working in the church wasn't real world. So I um, honored him. I moved to Houston and I quickly found a job and I was introduced to WHCC through my parents. Over six years, I worked and I saved up for graduate school and I immersed myself in ministry at W, wanting to explore as much as possible. I soon became a youth Sunday school teacher. Um, I was a D-Camp counselor. Actually, here's a bit of trivia for you. Back then, we didn't have D-Camp and Impact. It was only D-Camp and it was middle school and high school combined. And so that was the first camp um, that I counseled at and it was a lot of fun. Um, I served on the core leadership team of CQs, which was our Christ-centered career fellowship group. And over six years, my love for the local church multiplied. My calling into pastoral ministry developed and intensified. A significant turning point in my life was when I took an unpaid leave of absence from my job and went on a two-month missions trip to Thailand to work with a missionary from our church. I wanted to test myself. I wanted to see if I really had missions in my blood, you know, if I was willing to count the cost. Um, before going, I believe strongly that that might be my calling. Well, um, after returning back from Thailand after two months there, I was convinced that the last thing I wanted to do was be a missionary. I was very lonely and very unhappy for those two months, despite the smiles on the photos that I took and sent home. It was not an easy experience for me. And years later, I would spend another month in Central America on missions and be overwhelmed with those same feelings. I enjoyed the people, the food. I loved getting to know the Thai culture. Um, my parents had brought me to Hong Kong a lot when I was young, so I was accustomed to living in different environments. But this time, it was different. I was overwhelmed with a feeling of isolation and lacked joy in serving. And perhaps the hardest part of the trip was listening to the stories of the missionary I shadowed. She shared all about the hardships and trials of being a missionary in Thailand. So one Sunday, I cried out to the Lord for help, and he answered me with Matthew 16. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Part of me didn't want to lose my life. I liked it. I enjoyed promotions at work. I enjoyed a fat paycheck every two weeks, having free time, hanging out with friends at C Cubed every weekend. But God gave me this challenge. Would I give up everything to follow him? I then recalled an event that had happened a couple years earlier before I went to Thailand. I was on the first planning committee for a retreat called Render. Some of you have been to Render. And it's an opportunity for those considering vocational ministry to get away, talk to pastors, pray, and discern their calling into the ministry. And at that retreat, I met a few women who were serving in children's, youth, and women's ministries. They were overworked, underpaid, and they felt discouraged. They were underappreciated in the church. And each of their churches did not ordain women as being a pastor because that role was recognized only for men. I wasn't sure what exactly I believed about women in ministry at that time, but I saw that there were hurting women serving in leadership positions in the church. And unlike the stories I heard from the missionaries in Thailand, these women's stories of discouragement only made me stronger. They didn't deter me, but they strengthened my resolve to join the ranks of them and work toward not only greater equality in the church, but to see more women unleashed to use their spiritual gifts in whatever way God was calling them to. So in 2003, I um, entered into full-time seminary studies. My calling was affirmed by WHCC staff and our faith community. I earned an MDiv in 2006 from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary and was hired as our youth minister that summer. But above all, I am a sinner saved by grace. I don't have it all figured out. I'm definitely a work in progress. I deal with my sins daily. And 
I experience God's mercies daily as well. The Holy Spirit is my counselor, my comforter. He's my guiding, my guide, and he guides my commitment to be faithful in using my gifts and calling for his good purposes. I don't know what the future holds, whether I pastor in an official role or not, but I know this, I am called to be set apart for the work of ministry for a lifetime. Thank you, Jody. Um, Jody's good friend, Vicky Chu, uh, from a, f- a classmate from Golden Commonwealth Seminary, accountability partner and mentor, and currently a missionary uh, in East Asia, uh, recorded a message of exhortation for Jody. So I'd like to show that right now before I give a charge to Jody. Can you show the video? Hello, PJ. It's such a joy to be able to call you that and to send you this video celebrating this day with you from afar. Um, I'm so thankful when I think about your life and how Father has allowed us to walk with each other through these years on both sides of the ocean. And as I've been praying for you, um, he has brought up in my heart over and over again this passage from Deuteronomy chapter 6, 4 to 9. Um, And I'm going to read them to you in its original version. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And so um, as you receive this commissioning um, from Father, I want to use this passage just to bless and commission you again from uh, one friend, one journey woman to another. So, Jodes, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, and may you always love the Lord our God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These words, which God is commanding you today, he is going to write them on the tablet of your heart, and you are going to teach them. May you teach them diligently to the people you serve, especially this next generation, including your own children. Um, Talk of these words, talk of his words when you are hosting people in your house or when you're sitting around the dinner table and when you walk from your car to the office or in the mall or in some, maybe on the way to the pool, may you talk of his words. And when you lie down at night before you go to bed, may his word be your meditation And when you get up in the morning, may his word be what you desire the most to know. Um, May you bind them. May may these words, may the words of God be written on the work that you do with your hands and be on your mind surrounding your forehead. May anyone who enters your home or your office see his words written on your lives, um, literally on the doorposts, on the entrances of uh, the doors in which you walk. So I'm so thankful for your life, dear friend, and celebrating you and praying for you. And I am so glad we can see each other very soon. Jody, it's uh, very much for a privilege, I think for all of us here to share this very special moment with you I am particularly thankful because I've been given a uh, special seat witnessing the unfolding of God's grace in your life. Uh, To have journeyed together here at this church, to have been blessed by your ministry, um, you being a key co-worker, a trusted advisor, a dear family friend, 
you have baptized and taught my kids. And um, I cannot be more grateful or joyful for what God has done in you and through you. The ordination of a woman pastor in a Chinese-American church uh, still does not happen very, very much. And you have been given a very special grace to blaze a new path in the kingdom of God. Your ordination represents a commendation to the greater body, consecration to your call, confirmation of your gifts and fruitfulness, and a special commissioning into what God is calling you to do. I'd like to read for you 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 5, passages that I think should be familiar to many of us. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. By having itchy ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myth. As for you, always be sober-minded. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. These words of Paul remain as relevant and timely today as it was almost 2,000 years ago. And I'd just like to share three thoughts from Paul's words with you. And first is this. Jody, your call to be a preacher and teacher who is in love and in full obedience to God. I've always been thankful, Jody, for your teachable heart. I pray that you will continue to stay humble and stay hungry, committing yourself to a lifetime of being a student of the word, presenting yourself as a worker approved and unashamed. I pray that your credential and authority to teach and preach would not be coming from any title or degree or even ministry experience, but as one who is deeply in love with God, as one who is continually growing in your joy and struggle to be obedient to God. Don't let the demands of life and ministry crowd out your own time with God. I was warned by my own teacher that in the busyness of ministry, not to become a starving waiter, in his way the saying, busily bringing entrees out of the kitchen and to the guests, but never having the opportunity to enjoy the dishes oneself. Seize every opportunity, on or off the pulpit, with or without words, proclaim and live out his word as one who has been tasting and experiencing daily the goodness of God. A second thought here is your call to be a patient and enduring shepherd for God's people in the image and likeness of Jesus. Jody, I've always admired your deep love for God's church, how you and Mike make time for people uh, inside and outside of the church. Um, and when downright, you all have no time. I don't know how you all do it, but you make time for people and the way that you believe, you believe and live out the ideals of Christian community. Don't lose heart when you face hardship. When no one listens, when you face criticisms, and when things get tough. I pray that God will give you thick skin, but keep your heart soft, not the other way around. It's easy to become jaded in the ministry. Do not give up on people, just as Jesus will not give up on you. The spirit of Jesus enables you to live out his life for them to die to yourself for the sheep. People will let you down. You will let you down. And in your moments of disillusionment and helplessness, don't question in the dark what God has shown you in the light. Keep crying out to God for your own soul and for your flock. 
a mentor of mine has a poster in front of his desk depicting a sheepdog in a snowstorm standing by a badly wounded sheep barking into distant darkness waiting for the shepherd the real shepherd to arrive endure persevere stand by your flock finally you're called to be an authentic and faithful steward and messenger of the priceless gospel of grace to be sober-minded is to be sensitive to what's really happening out there and what is really happening inside of you one thing about ministry over the years i found that just an increasing awareness of one's unworthiness to do this work and i've always felt that ministry and spiritual leadership tests one's deepest sense of security if that sense of security is placed in anything else my ability experience achievements relationships reputations if it is anything apart from the grace of God I'll fall hard and ministry becomes a painful and pitiful place become an act to keep up to keep up an act to keep up a certain appearance to keep up with people's expectations to keep up with the other ministers and churches are doing ministry will become an awful awful burden so be inspired but don't compare know that the one who has called you is faithful and will sustain you in your journey ahead you're being entrusted with many gifts to serve but this most important gift that is at the core of your mission and commission is the gospel of Jesus. It is a gospel of grace. In all that you will face in the future, hold on to the fact that whatever God demands, his grace supplies. So my dear sister, may you rely fully on this grace. Fulfill your call and ministry for the grace and the glory of now, Minister Jody, I'd like to ask you to stand. I have a couple questions for you. And Pastor Mike can stand with you too. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Jody, do you commit to sanctify yourself to live out a life that's worthy of your call according to the, uh, God, as the minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, seeking always to place the honor of the Lord Jesus and the well-being of his flock entrusted to you above your own honor and well-being. I do. Jody, do you commit to keep studying and growing in the word of God, faithfully proclaiming the gospel, whether in season or out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with great patience and instructions, serving with a humble heart to minister, to lead, to love the flock of God, making every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace? I do. Jody, do you commit to be a faithful and good steward of God's church, Kindle the gift that God has given you. Build his church. Be self-controlled in all things. Endure hardship. Do the work of evangelists. Fulfill the commission of the pastoral ministry given to you by the Lord. I do. Thank you. I'd like to ask everyone to stand with Jody and Michael as well. I'd like to ask one of the congregation that you as the people of God, that do you as the body of Christ and witnesses before the Lord together with Jody and Mike, affirming your confidence in Minister Jody Chang and pledge your personal support, verbal encouragement, continue prayer for Jody and Mike and to love them and protect them and provide for them, encourage them and build them up to help them to fulfill the ministry commission that's given to them, given to her by the Lord. If you do, we do. Thank you. Please remain standing. I'd like to ask the ordination council runners to come up and also Jody and Pastor Mike to come up as well for the commissioning prayer ordination and the laying on of hands. Lord Jesus, we applaud your wisdom and your grace. 
because a long, long time ago, even before the foundations of the earth were laid, you called Jody. You made her your daughter. You invited her into the greatest adventure of her life. Lord Jesus, we praise you for the relationship that Jody has for you. We ask that you, by your spirit, would guard it. And Lord, that you would help her to cultivate it. For you are the vine and we're just branches. We need you to pump life into us. We need you to water us. We need you to take care of us, to shelter us from the storm, from the sun rays sometimes even. And Lord God, we ask that you would be there for Jody, that you would be her gardener, that you would be her friend. And then af that, and after any huge events or big victories, or trials, that you would be there for her then as well. So after a Sunday, or after a youth retreat, Lord God, that she would choose to draw near to you, because then you will draw near to her. It's a guarantee. Lord Jesus, we pray too that you will, not just on this day, but you will continually encourage her, that she would know and experience that from her team here at her church, but that she would also have a whole network of others who will support her, pray for her, rejoice over her, listen to her. And Lord Jesus, we thank you as well that you have a way of speaking love to us through our families and just through surprises. And even this weekend has been full of that. And so Lord Jesus, make your promises come true in Jody's life. Fulfill the desires of her heart because she is sold on you. We ask this in the amazing name of Jesus. Amen. Father God, we come. We praise you for your faithfulness, for your grace. We give you thanks for Jody, for giving her as a gift to our church. We rejoice in what you have done in her life. Oh, the Lord Jesus, the Savior, you have called her. You taught her. You greatly used her, especially in ministering to the youth and their parents. Father, we thank, thank you. Father, we pray that you, uh, you pour down your continuous gracious presence in her life. Would you guide her path, continue to strengthen her, Father, annoy her with your great power that she will proclaim boldly your gospel and would have great patience to build your people for your glory. Father, I ask that you will add to her the great joy of serving you and allow her to see the fruit of the ministry. Father, we also pray especially for her family. I pray that you, uh, Jody and Mike, that you would need their heart together in complete unity and enable them to work through their differences with passion, with gentleness. Father, enable them with one mind as they disciple their children. Help them uh, to bring them up in your training, in your instruction and enable them to use godly counsel to guide them. Father, would you protect them, make this family, as they grow, they will bring you glory, will be great example for our people. Father, would you protect them and bless them? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for our sister Jody and for calling her to be a shepherd, Lord, um, that the gifting is so evident and that everyone here confirms it today. We know, Lord, that you are almighty God and you have so worked in her life and shown her a wonderful impact that she's able to do for your glory name's sake. Uh, so many young people's lives impacted um, all the fruitfulness of all these young people coming to know you. And uh, we thank you so much for giving her the vision um, 
um, to come and, and shepherd these young ones. And uh, we pray, Lord, that you continue to be faithful as we know you always are through Jody and Mike and allow them to see many young people and just multiply their ministry, Lord. Wherever you lead her, we know that she is a shepherd of yours. Uh, may she continue to do your work and to do it well and to see the joy and the gratefulness of what it is to be a child of yours and to be used by you greatly. So we pray in Christ's name. Father God, as we commission uh, Jody to you, we commission her into your work of ministry. And as we do so, God, we pray that you would protect her, that you would protect her heart, that you would protect her family. Um, God, we know that this is a dangerous calling. This Sometimes the challenges, the discouragement that comes can cripple us and uh, make us feel unworthy or inadequate. But God, I pray that Jody would be protected by the words of the Apostle Paul, who says that you, God, have made us competent to be ministers of the new covenant. And I pray that she would be strengthened, that she would not grow weary, that she would run this race, and that she would pour out herself like a drink offering, knowing that she stands now and forever approved as a minister of the gospel of Jesus. I pray that you would guard her, mind, her heart and her mind in Christ Jesus, I pray that she would hold every thought uh, captive to, to Christ and that she would be deeply rooted in her identity in Christ, that she would not build her identity on ministry. She would not build her uh, ministry, um, her identity on the affirmation of others and ministry accomplishment, but that she would base her identity solely on the blood of Jesus that has covered her, that has made her new and has, will sustain her to the end. We thank you for this, sister pray that you would protect her family. I pray that she would see ministry, not just in the church, but in the home, that her and Mike are partners in the Great Commission to their own children for Cole and Noel, and number three to come. And God, we pray that uh, her ministry would be fruitful at all levels. But in order to do that, God, may you protect her. May you guard her time. May you guard the way that she expends her energy on things that are the most uh, glorifying to you and good for her and her family, God. So we pray in the name of Jesus that you would protect this sister and her family. Send her out um, with your grace that will sustain her for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, I come before you uh, to commission uh, Jody as a leader in the church of Jesus Christ. In this world, Lord, there are different ways that people lead. They preside, they dictate, they bully. But Lord God, we come before you to ask that your Holy Spirit lead and guide Jody to be the biblical leader you call us all to be, a shepherd. And as a shepherd, Lord God, may she care for her sheep. May she love the sheep because she loves you. May she feed them constantly with your word and knowledge of you. Lord God, may she so be intimately, in, not, have the intimate knowledge of each and every one of the, of, of the sheep that even if one go missing, that she will even leave those 99 behind to go seek out the one that's lost. Lord God, may she be the one, the shepherd, who also would be sacrificing her own life for her sheep. And so, Lord God, we pray for her to be that shepherd, that shepherd who knows not to run so fast ahead that she loses her sheep, to not just lag behind and just watch them wander off. But, Lord, may she walk like a shepherd, two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward always in the lead, one step back so that the sheep know where she is, and constantly two steps forward and one step back, just always constantly moving forward. And forward after what, Lord God? Of course, after you. Be thou her vision. As you called your first disciples, Lord God, come, follow me. That in Jody's leadership, that her vision comes from not just leading, not from reading books, not from, from uh, just talking with other people, that it comes from just following step by step after you. We pray for you to send us, send her out on behalf of this church to be the shepherd that this church needs 
for your kingdom and for your glory. Amen. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for our sister and what you've done in Jody's life. We pray for your continued protection and provision in her life. May she always minister out of that deep place of rich communion with you. And may you make her fruitful. Lord, and make her that fruitfulness coming from the, at the place of her greatest joy and satisfaction and ministry to her husband and her children and overflowing from there to impacting lives for you. May her ministry continue, her life, her ministry continue to be a source of delight to you and the thanksgiving of your people. Use her for your praise and glory, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Congratulations, Pastor Jody. On behalf of the church, this is the certificate of your ordination. And this is the gift from council. Message as uh, her first message as Reverend Jody Chung. Wow, I haven't kneeled that long in a long time. And uh, just to clarify, I'm not pregnant with number three. <laughs> I know you're all thinking about that when we were praying. We are adopting number three, so praise God, yes. Um, don't be so quick to clap, because you know I'm going to call on all of you guys to help with my children, so <laughs> be ready for that. Well, one of the things I love to do is run, and these are my favorite running shoes. Actually, that's not the entire truth. I actually, deep in my heart, do not like running that much. Sorry, Bob. I have run a lot in my life, but I really don't like running. And I like these shoes, not because I love running, because I think they look cool and they're very comfortable. But my disdain for running began in college. After realizing that the freshman 15 was not just a saying, I enrolled in my first jogging class to shed that freshman 15. It met at 7 a.m. in the morning, and we were told to start by running seven minutes per class and add two minutes each week. Easy, right? Well, uh, I hadn't run in a long time. I don't think I've ever run, actually, before taking that jogging class. So my first run around the track was completely pathetic. I was dragging my feet, my heart was pounding, I was sweating, my legs felt like logs. And after that first month of class, I told my roommate in these exact words. I said, I'd rather lay down in the middle of the street and get run over by a large truck than go back to jogging class. It was that painful. You know, the basic human tendency is to escape pain. When our lives are, are hard, when they're filled with stress, when I don't feel like exercising, we take steps to minimize that stress. We offload responsibilities. We plan a vacation. We spend too much. We binge watch on something to escape our responsibilities. Or we isolate ourselves and families from the rest of this stressful world. You know, I think the immigrant generation before us, our parents, they really know, knew how to suffer more than us. Instead, we've become a generation prone to impatience, to giving up when the going gets tough, especially when we don't see a good outcome to our suffering. The larger problem is the human tendency to give up on passionately pursuing Jesus because it's too hard. I mean, the youth ask me all the time, Jody, how do we worship 
a God we can't see or feel. It's too hard or it's too messy. I've had people ask me, half jokingly, can I love God and not my neighbor? I'm like, no, it's one and the same command, love God and love neighbor. But it's too messy, relationships. And it's too countercultural. We see the difficulty of understanding God's design for marriage. And so eventually, a biblical understanding of marriage is replaced with um, personal feelings or what the society views our definition of marriage should be. Or we give up on marriage altogether, as some youth nowadays are doing. Studying the Bible is hard. And too often, I myself have given up on rigorously adhering to a biblical worldview to interpret the world through the lens of the scriptures rather than my own reasoning. And when I see the youth struggle year after year to have faith, I sometimes wonder, is it even possible to pass faith on to the next generation given our climate, given the culture and society that we live in? The obstacles seem insurmountable. The truth is the Christian life is like running a race. But it's not a competitive race where runners compete for first, second, and third place, although we do run as if to win a prize. And it's not a sprint in which the goal is to run as fast as we can. Rather, the life of faith, a life of trusting in the Lord and doing his work, is comparable to running a marathon. How many of you here have run a marathon? I've run a half marathon. Oh, good. I know Bob has run like 20 marathons. Um, it's comparable to running a marathon. It's a long race with a start and a finish line. All believers are called to run this race, to start and cross the finish line. 2 Timothy 4.7 says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Acts 20 verse 24 says, My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. And my exhortation for today is from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. Would you stand once again with me and read it? It's in your bulletins. Let's read this passage together. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Thank you. You may be seated. I have three points for today, because every sermon has three points, right? Let us run without hindrance. Let us run with perseverance. Let us run fixing our eyes on Jesus. In chapter 11, the author of Hebrews defines faith as the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. And then he lists these men and women who have become to readers and become to us our heroes of the faith from the Old Testament. They're living examples of what it means to keep the faith no matter what. They are inspiration and our role model. And when we struggle to trust in the Lord, we reread their stories to find encouragement to keep running. Slide one. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. So the Bible says to run a race, it's best to run unhindered. Duh, right? We knew that. Well, during the semester of suffering in jogging class, I realized that if the night before jogging class, I binged on pizza and beverages, non-alcoholic beverages, that is, the late night the night before, I would get these side cramps. And I would just have this urge to vomit because, you know, during the middle of semester, you're eating pizza and then you're up to like 20 minutes of running three times a week. And so I just, it would feel bad. The undigested food weighed me down. I love the NLT version, which says, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. 
what are the weights that slow us down? I can imagine both Cain and Abel thought about taking shortcuts when they were required to offer. They're probably thinking, oh, I don't don't need to offer my best. But Abel did the right thing. He threw off the weight of greed and gave God his best. Or Rahab, she could have easily been weighed down by fear of the authorities. Um, She was a Jewish, she was a prostitute, worthy of death by Jewish law. Um, But she had courage and obedience that and believe that God would save her. So she threw off fear of death and gained life for herself by hiding those spies, not only for herself, but for her whole household. And she became the great-great-grandmother of King David, the second king of Israel, a prostitute, became the great-great-grandmother because she threw off the sin that could have easily entangled. And Jesus became the last king of Israel. And if you want to read about that, you can buy my husband's book. Do you like that, honey? Okay. Recently, Pastor Edward preached a sermon on 1 Corinthians 5, in which his main point was, the cross-shaped life is the sin-destroying life. We fight together by mourning our sin and confronting our sin. As a pastor, my priority should be to wage war against the sin that is destroying our lives. I think the church is doing a wonderful job nowadays of being gracious, of welcoming everybody, of accepting people. But what maybe we can do a little better job of is not accepting sin, of confronting the sin in our lives. Sin deceives us into believing that we're living the cross-centered life, but in reality, we're on a subtle downward slope, headed towards possibly dropping out of the race altogether. Sin convinces us that we're running the wrong race or that there's a problem with this race marked out for us. I recently spoke to an Asian American Christian group at UT Austin on the topic of sexual sins. They asked me to speak about sexual sins. So in a survey that I made for these college students attending that evening, I found out that 30% of the students there did not believe premarital sex was a sin. And Asian Americans tend to be very conservative on these side of statistics. I think the average statistics among young people today is closer to 60 or 70 percent don't believe premarital sex is a sin. Human desire, human wisdom, self-centeredness now govern sex. Maybe churches need to do a better job at taking sin seriously because this next generation is giving up on sexual purity. This is sin convincing us that that race marked out for us isn't good enough. In that same survey, I also asked, how difficult is it to abstain from sin, to abstain from any kind of sexual activity? And over 60%, 65% reported that it was extremely difficult to abstain from any kind of sexual activity. Clearly, running this race requires stamina and a resolve not to give up. The next slide. So let us run with perseverance. A few years ago, the big hype among educators was this word called grit. I actually didn't even know what it meant until our youth deacon told me about it. And it comes as no surprise that an Asian mom, Angela Lee Duckworth, made popular this concept of grit, which she defines as passion and perseverance for long-term goals. Grit absolutely applies to the Christian life. It takes passion and perseverance to endure disappointments in life and still trust in the Lord. I'm sure many of you have experienced that. However, the running the race is not this goal. It's a long-term relationship with our Heavenly Father, beginning now and crossing the line, finish line into eternity. Interestingly, I don't know if you saw this, the new critique of grit is research indicating that endurance might not be healthy at all. In fact, it could be very costly. Maybe we shouldn't have so much grit. So NPR recently featured an article, again by Angela Duckworth, called Knowing When to Quit from an Expert on Grit. And she says, there, are really, there really are dead ends in life. When you've tried hard and long enough 
to guess you're in one, back up and look for another way forward. Turn your dead ends into detours. Well, perhaps some of you have tried hard and long enough and realized the Christian life is a dead end, that God is not sovereign, that God doesn't satisfy our deepest longings. Otherwise, why am I still single? Why am I still without a job? Why can I still not have kids? Satan tries to convince us that the Lord is a liar, just as the serpent said to Eve, did God really say you can't eat that fruit? To believe in the Bible, for many, has become to believe in a bunch of dead-end lies. To this, I would say, the biblical call to run with perseverance implies there will be temptations to fall away. Otherwise, why would we have to have perseverance if there were nothing to persevere through? It's not a matter of if we'll have temptations to fall away. It's a matter of when. Our call is not to give up this good fight, even if it costs us everything. The scriptures say to live is Christ and to die is gain. Yet we are immersed in an individualistic society. I am individualistic too many times, overly focused on self-achievements. And yes, pastors do it too. And pleasure. We feel entitled to good health, a retirement plan, the right to live comfortably and serve us and our families above all else. The Bible says, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, which may look different than the race we set for ourselves to run. The reason I chose this passage for my ordination is because looking back, Perhaps the area I have grown the most in these past 11 years as youth minister is perseverance. There have been times I have wanted to quit. Caring for others, grieving with broken families and broken people, serving without immediate reward has taken a toll on my physical health, my mental health, and certainly my marriage and family life at times. But when I'm down and feeling like I just can't do it anymore, I always go back to my calling. I remember that God called me to shepherd this flock, rain or shine, through tears of joy or tears of pain. There's no turning back. He has not yet given me permission to do so. It's not that WHTC needs me. It's that I am to run with perseverance this race with all of you to help lead you in this race simply because this is the race that God has set before us. How do I do this? I asked myself by fixing my eyes on Jesus. Next slide. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. He is the author and perfecter of our faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. When I forget the gospel, when I slip into performance mode, people-pleasing mode, when my pride gets ahead of me, and I become discontent and dissatisfied with my calling, and I have these 11 years, a lot of times I felt like I was getting too old. I'm like the oldest youth pastor in town. I feel too uncool. I'm totally awkward at times. You guys know. The youth all know. I'm very awkward. But now I just embrace my awkwardness, right? I just have to be happy with it. This is a race marked out for me. The only way to persevere is ultimately to fix our eyes on Jesus, not ourselves and not on other Christians. My husband always tells me we look at Christ, not Christians, as our primary example of who to follow. And the only way to persevere So we persevere to fix our eyes on Jesus because Jesus is the perfect example of faith that we are to express. He displayed perfect trust and obedience in God the Father. He is a source of our salvation. He grows our faith, which is what it means to be the perfecter of our faith. And he will eventually perfect us at the second coming. He loves like no one else can love. He endured the biggest injustice of them all. My kids always say, life is not fair, Mommy. I said, well, Jesus dying on the cross was not fair. He's like, huh? 
You know, Jesus was accused. He was mocked, shamed. He was nailed to the cross, but he had done nothing wrong. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Jesus endured the cross for the joy of offering salvation to the world. He doesn't ask us to go where he hasn't already been. He doesn't ask us to suffer what he already hasn't suffered. Next slide. The next verse says, Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The word consider means to think seriously about the fact that Jesus also suffered, so we can too. We can fix our eyes on Jesus and remember that he understands and so we don't lose heart. My experience is when we fix our eyes on Jesus, God's love will fill our hearts. God's love will humble us and remind us of how great a cost he paid. God's kindness leads us to repentance. Not God's wrath, not God hammering us with the Bible, but it's ultimately his kindness and love shown on the cross. And through it all, when we fix our eyes on Jesus, we will find joy in running this race. I know that through it all, I've had great joy. My whole life, I think God has given me the gift of joy. In fact, my, middle, my name, the initials of my name spell joy. And I think that was on purpose. That to just be able to tell people that through it all, God does not disappoint. I've had great joy in serving the Lord through life, even though it hasn't always been easy. I learned that sometimes... Just like when you love somebody, when you're in a marriage, when you're dating, or even in your family, sometimes you have to choose love, even when you don't love them. You don't feel like it. I was just about to begin my, and I'll close with this, I was just about to begin my second year of seminary when I got the call. My mom said my dad had a stroke and was going into surgery. The actual diagnosis we found was much worse. Stage four esophageal cancer. And that cancer had grown beyond the esophagus into brain tumors, which burst, leaving him semi-paralyzed, wheelchair-bound. I withdrew from seminary that semester to be at home. Those were some of the most trying, agonizing months, yet there were still glimpses of hope and laughter, even in that pain. How can joy and death be spoken of in the same sentence I asked myself throughout that semester. When we're so broken, I believe God's comfort is near. And when we're confused about what will happen in life, God is sovereign. My dad, though his faith was relatively young, though his understanding of the scriptures was limited, he persevered through those six months since he had that stroke up to when he passed away. And he persevered with dignity and praises on his lips. I was surprised. He gave glory to God, and he surrendered his condition to the Lord. He chose this over anger. One day I entered his hospital room. He was joking around with the nurses there. And he said, oh, here's my daughter, Jody. And he proudly told them, my daughter is studying to become a pastor. He just smiled with such pride that I was going to become a pastor someday. Though he had been brought low, his body filled with cancer, his prognosis grim, he could boast to these nurses that his daughter was called to be a pastor. I wish I could be here today to tell him what I never did. I'm proud of you, Dad. And the way you did not grow weary or lose heart. You ran the race well, not giving up even until the very end, though that finish line was so tough to cross for you. Like those Old Testament heroes of the faith, thank you for giving meaning to my fight today, for inspiring me to keep going as a minister of the gospel all these years. Today is a dream come true for me. I have been dreaming of ordination 
for all the right reasons and some wrong ones too, for a very long time. I'm truly grateful that today I get to be confirmed, consecrated, commissioned, and commended by my family, by the body of Christ. This is not just some ceremony for me, which is probably why I was so nervous coming. This means so much. It's my public vow to be faithful to my calling. And it's me receiving this gift of you affirming me in this calling. I am thankful God chose me to run this race and persevere until today. By his grace, we together will not grow weary in exercising our gifts and calling for his good purposes. Thank you. Let's stand. Um, thank you, Pastor Jody, for that message. And uh, let's respond with this song um, of how deep our Father's love uh, together as the body of Christ. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure That he should give his only son To make a wretched treasure How great the pain of searing love the Father turns his face away As wounds just mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory Sing, Behold. Behold a man upon the cross. My sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice. Call out among the scoffers. It was my sin. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is fair. I will not boast. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. I will boast. But I will boast in Jesus Christ. His death and resurrection. 
Why should I? Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. This moves have been my rest. Sing it one more time. Why should I? Why should I? For Jody's ordination, I think Jody wants to uh, be able to take some pictures with some youth, and uh, people want to take pictures, can stick around. And, and there's, there's reception in the Family Life Center. Thank. And a first, a picture with the youth coming up. We we'll ask for pictures and families. Okay. And thank you for being here. And we have a reception in the uh, Family Life Center. Thank you for being a blessing to our church and to Jody. Thank you very much. If I could get Hello. Thank you. Can I get youth past like former youth and present youth to come up and take a picture with me? So if you were ever in my youth group, come on up. A God of grace. 